I'd just love to now spend a bit of time sharing with you from the Bible, from God's Word, see what God can instruct us and teach us and encourage us with today. And that's the, the beauty God has given us, isn't he? His, his Word, its instructions for us, it reveals who he is, it shows how we can know him, and it shows how he loves us and cares for us and wants to be with us. Um, so we're going to be spending a little bit of time looking at what God says from his word, the Bible. Um, if you have a Bible with you, you may want to turn to Exodus chapter 35, um, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 to 3 from the story of Exodus. Um, if you haven't got a Bible, there are a couple on the sides if, you, if you'd like one and you haven't got one with you, or as often is the case, it's mainly on your phone now, isn't it? So if you want to open your phones at page 75, you can uh, follow the story. So we're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 35. And what I want to be talking about today is rest, rest and work. Um, I don't know what you say to people when they ask you maybe at the end of the day or the end of the week, how have you been, what your answer normally is. But I find it's often, oh, I've been so busy. I've just been so busy and I'm feeling really tired. That's often how we respond, isn't it? With the, often our response is, oh, I've just, I'm overwhelmed with stuff. I'm so busy. But at the same time, I'm also really tired. And um, how would it, can you imagine how it looked if you actually boasted about your resting? And someone said, oh, how's your week been? How's your day been? Oh, actually, I've just had a lovely rest today. You know what? I spent three hours just walking around the park, doing nothing. Imagine what difference that would be to people. It's like, our culture is one of busyness, isn't it? Our culture is one that drives, and, and even just in the language and the way we're expected to respond to people, it's about busyness. The busier you are, maybe the more important you are. The busier you are, <coughs> the more status you have. The busier you are, um, the more blessed you are. But actually, I want to talk about actually resting, and particularly resting in God, is something that we all need. Because we all get tired. Yeah, I said, you know, I've been busy, but actually I'm tired. And why do we get tired? Well, we need rest. Why do we need rest? Because we get tired. <laughs> That's fundamentally why we need rest. There's, a, there's a, another church leader friend of mine who I was with the other week, and he's, he's been reading this book on sleep. And um, Michael Mosley, unfortunately, that, the, the guy who died in that Greek island, he's written several books on sleep because in rest, sleep is so important. And we're becoming more and more aware, aren't we, of this need to, to have good sleep and what good sleep patterns look like. So there's a culture of wanting to know what sleep is like and what sleep looks like. There's again, on the other hand, about this busyness, we're told that efficient work is the goal we need to be aiming for. To be efficient, we need to maximize our time for work. The more time we work, the better things will be. And taken to its ultimate conclusion, if you like, because humans are weak and need rest, then the more we can get machines to do, the better it will be. And this has been the driving force of the Industrial Revolution and now the Technological Revolution why we have AI, and why even now some of the arguments around euthanasia say that humans are no longer able to be effective and cause others to be ineffective, then the best thing is to remove them from society. That's the ultimate aim, that's the ultimate trajectory, if you like, of this whole idea of busyness. And we wear ourselves out trying to fit into this culture of busyness. We wear ourselves out trying to do more. And yet we're tired. We're tired and we become increasingly tired. But why is that? Why is that the case? Why is there this driving force to be busy? And at the same time, this weakness or seeming weakness in us that makes us tired to the extent that we become technically ineffective as machines to do things. Well, I'll tell you why. Because actually rest was something God given. 
God actually introduced red, rest. God made it this way. We are supposed to have periods of rest. The pattern of work and rest is God-given. It's not a man-made and not a man-made institution. It's not a human idea, work and rest. It's a God-given, God-introduced, God-ordained thing. Um, right at the beginning in Genesis, we see that God made the world in how many days? Six days. However you interpret that period of time, um, but it was six literal days or six long periods, whatever, you, whatever you view you hold on that, it was a defined period where God was creating. And it says on the seventh, he rested from it. So he didn't go on creating things because he got to the point where he'd, he'd made everything. And when he looked at it, it says it was very good. And so God was able to rest in the goodness of everything that he'd made. It wasn't that he was tired. It wasn't that God was tired and had got worn out by creating everything. Um, we get tired, don't we, just by digging the garden, but he just created everything. Um, but he wasn't tired. He didn't need to rest, but he rested. He took the moment to rest and just to relish in literally the goodness of everything that he had made. So that was a wonderful thing that he put into, into the pattern. <coughs> Excuse me. And in the Garden of Eden, there was this pattern of work and rest that Adam and Eve would work in the garden, tending the Garden of Eden, and God would come and walk in the cool of the evening, it says, with them. This moment of cool, you know, thank goodness we've had a hot day, haven't we? One hot day so far of the summer this year. Um, but isn't it wonderful in that cool of the evening when you relax and it's a bit cooler and you can walk with people? And that was this moment of knowing God. Adam and Eve would walk with him in this pattern of work and rest, but it wasn't burdensome. <coughs> but then disobedience to God came in. Sin disrupted this ideal pattern, of, and, and work became a toil. Work became a toil out of God's presence. And sometimes a seemingly impossible task. If you've ever tried to clear bindweed from your garden, you know it's an impossible task or seemingly impossible. And that's what work had become like because of Adam as an Eve, disobedience and lack of faith in God. So really what happened, without God and without knowing him, our whole pattern of work and rest is disrupted. So now I just want to read this passage from Exodus chapter 35, verses 1 to 3. And Moses, who was leading the people out, he's led them out of slavery. They, they were on their way to the promised land that God had given them and had promised them. And it says this in verse 1 to 3. Moses assembled the whole Israelite community and said to them, These are the things the Lord has commanded you to do. For six days work is to be done, but the seventh day shall be your holy day. A day of Sabbath rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it is to be put to death. Do not light a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. So this pattern of work and rest was so important that at this point in the history of God's people, God had to remind Moses to actually put it into law. He says, you've got to, you've got to legislate for this special period of rest, to spend time with God and getting to know him again. It was so important that when you read in Leviticus chapter 23, when God is laying out the feasts of celebration for the Israelite people, <clears throat> the list of these celebrations in Leviticus chapter 3 starts with, it says a Sabbath. You start with a Sabbath. The first, the first feast of remembering and knowing God is the Sabbath. <clears throat> Before we can celebrate and worship God, we need to know him. And this passage also shows us, shows us that, yes, it's to be enshrined in legislation to make it happen, because otherwise, if you don't, you're just going to continue to work and work and work, because work is really hard, and you need to get the harvest in. God says, I'm going to put a day into your law that you've got to remember to set aside and spend time with me. It seems that important. And it's so important that actually if you do any work on this day, 
then that person should be put to death. Wow. Imagine being put to death for working on a particular day. That's the opposite of what euthanasia says, isn't it? Wow. God's commandment. Incredible thing. God had made this pattern and God wanted Moses and the people of God to be reminded of it. So he built it into their legislation. So why do we have rest? Well, we cannot know God, we cannot serve God without resting in him, setting time aside to be with him. Now, the passage in Exodus we've just looked at, when you read on the next verses, there's a lot of things to be done. (laughs) There's a lot of things that God has asked the people of God to do. They've got to prepare the tabernacle, the tent of where God's going to meet with them. They've got all the preparations to make this thing, the curtains, the altar, the lampstands, the, the curtains, the outer covering, um, the garments for the priest. There's so much to get done and so much to be done. The list is really, really daunting. I don't know about your to-do list, what your to-do list looks like, but they had this massive to-do list. But before even they get to it, God says, no. This is what I command you. Work to be done on six days, but the seventh day is a day of a holy day to the Lord to be reminded of what I have to do. Yes, there's lots to do. There's so much to do. But you've got to build in this day of rest. You've got to build in this time of knowing and meeting with me. Because faced with our to-do list, I think often there's, I don't know about you, but I have two responses to my to-do list or my in-tray Whatever, my, whatever your in-tray looks like. You either just ignore it and hope that at some point it's going to get to the point where it's no longer important and it'll just go away. So I just give up. My to-do list is too big. I'm just going to ignore it. Or the other thing is to work harder, isn't it? I have to go over give these things by giving more time to it. I must get this done. I must get this done. And so for the Israelites, there was a busy period coming up. All these things need to be done. And yet... In this, God says, build a day of rest. And it's not, it's not just the seventh day that's, that's important in this. Because in Leviticus chapter 23, which talks about the festivals of celebration of God, the things that you're reminded to do, there's something called the Day of Atonement, which is like the culmination, if you like, of all the feasts for that year. And the Day of Atonement <coughs> was a time when the priests would take a sacrifice from the people of God once a year and they would slay it and this was for the forgiveness of the sins of the people for that year they had to do this the priest slaughtered the animal the blood was sprinkled on the altar of this tent of meeting that they built and it meant that the sins had been washed away and that had to be done every year on this day of atonement which was in the seventh month of the year Sevens are there, not an insignificant number. Seven, the seventh month. And what God calls this day of atonement, he calls it a Sabbath day. Now, when you read through it, it says this on the 10th day of the seventh month, you'll have to have this day of atonement. And um, so it would not be a traditional Sabbath, if you like. The day of atonement was never the seventh day. It might sometimes fall on the seventh day, but it generally wasn't the seventh day of the week. But God calls it a Sabbath day. Why? Because it's a moment of significance of what God has done, where you see God in action, where you see his saving power and grace. That's the Sabbath day. The Sabbath is not just about resting because we're tired. The Sabbath is not just about a God-ordained thing because we're weak humans and we need a bit of a rest, which is true. He does give us that. And he's enshrined that, as we said, (coughs) into the Old Testament law. And it's in our very bodies. We work, we get tired. So we can see that. But the Sabbath is also much more than that. A Sabbath is a Sabbath day, a Sabbath moment is to to be a time when you reflect on what God has done for you, you, that you know his love and his kindness. The fact that God had put in place a system that would take your sin away and make you right before God was a cause of celebration. It was a time to set time aside and remember it and say, God, you are, you are so gracious. 
I don't deserve your love. I don't deserve your compassion. And that was a day to remember this by, this day of atonement, and it was called a Sabbath rest. So <clears throat> the, the Sabbath is, is, in all its fullness, is God-given. It's not just something we need to recover from, but it's to also to prepare us for what God has to do. And knowing God puts us back into the right understanding of work and rest and a reminder of the vision and call to what we're doing. Because we can get caught up in the busyness of church, the busyness of getting things ready for a Sunday morning, the busyness of wanting to do things, the busyness of serving the poor. All, those, all that busyness we can get caught up with. And if we're not careful, if we don't take these Sabbath moments to spend time with God, to know him, to rest in him, to hear from him, to know his kindness and goodness, then we will become driven people who think we need to please God by working harder. And that's not what God intended at all. He says, come and know me first. And I will speak to you of the things I've called you to. And I will equip you and envision you to do it. But we need to be reminded to keep coming back as God had put into, spoken to Moses, this commandment to come back to God. Because he knew without that, we'd just become weary and weary and weary. But where do we now find our rest? So this was a commandment that God had given Moses to the people of Israel. Where do we now find our rest? Well, most of you can imagine we're now leading to Jesus. In the Gospel of John, so the first Gospel in the New Testament in the Bible, we hear a story of Jesus healing a blind man. And what does he do in that story? He says he mixes some mud and a bit of water and he puts it in the eyes of the man, and he prays over the man. And the man's sight is restored. A blind man receives healing. And then in John 9, 13, John chapter 9, verse 9, John chapter 9, verse 13 to 16, this is what happens after this event. It says, the people brought to the Pharisees, so the religious leaders, the one who knew the law, and were the ones who were instructed in it, and would instruct everybody and the people in it, they brought this man who just received healing to the Pharisees. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a, wasn't a Monday, wasn't a Tuesday. It was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. And he said, he put mud on my eyes. Now, we think that's a strange story, don't we? But actually what we see is that Jesus was working. He was working the ground, which is something you didn't do on a Sabbath. He was making mud. He was digging in the mud. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed. And now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. Jesus was working on the Sabbath. And then in the three other Gospels, we have two other stories close together where Jesus goes out and picks some wheat for his followers to eat. Taking in the crops. Harvest. You're not supposed to do that on the Sabbath. No work. And he helps and heals a man with a shriveled hand. And he heals this man on a Sabbath. Jesus heals and does work on a Sabbath. So you can see from the command given to Moses why the religious was, religious was so angry with Jesus. Because he was working on a Sabbath. And what did the punishment for working on a Sabbath mean? Or was? Death. So the Pharisees wanted to kill Jesus because he was doing stuff they shouldn't do on a Sabbath. He can't be from God because he's not keeping the Sabbath. He was disobeying the Sabbath. They plotted to put him to death. But what is Jesus' response to this? How does Jesus reply to this accusation? Is he just being a rebel and thinking, you know what? <laughs> I don't like this law about not working on a Sabbath. Um, phew, I'm just going to stick. I was going to say two fingers, but there we go. <laughs> But that's the sort of idea of rebellion that um, 
It could happen, could be, couldn't it? It could be like Jesus was just seen as a bit of a bit of a naughty rebel. And they say, I can't do this, I'm just gonna do it. Was that why Jesus was doing it? No, the response to Jesus when they accuse him of working on the Sabbath. He says this in Mark chapter 2, verse 27 to 28. He says, then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. The command of the Sabbath day, a holy day set about to be restored and strengthened in God, is no longer about keeping a special day. It is now found in Jesus. That's what he was saying. And he is actually Lord of the Sabbath. Who is Lord of the Sabbath? Who is the one that gave the commandment of the Sabbath to to Moses and the Israelites? It's God. God gave this commandment. So when Jesus is saying, I am Lord of the Sabbath, he's saying, I am God. I am the one now who comes and gives you peace and rest. And Jesus says he's Lord of the Sabbath. He's saying he's the one who fulfills every aspect of, of God's goodness and saving power. The day of atonement has come. The Sabbath of atonement. I'm Lord of that. He's the fulfillment of that day of atonement. The time and place where people are made holy and set apart from God. Do you know that? Do you know Jesus? Do you know this wonderful Sabbath rest? This Sabbath moment of knowing God has saved you through his son Jesus. Jesus is your salvation. And Jesus offers it to us now. It says, he says, come, it's a slightly different commandment to the commandment to six days of work and one day of rest. Jesus offers us now a new invitation. He says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That Sabbath, rest for your souls. Come to Jesus and you will find this wonderful rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's what Jesus is recorded as saying in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 29. We need to ensure we find our rest in Jesus in in the busyness of serving him. Do you have those moments when you reflect and and say, I want to know you again, God. I'm going to spend some time seeking you and being with you, listening to you, hearing for you. New day. What a great opportunity. I know you're not going to get much sleep, so it's not going to be that restful in that sense. But this is a week, a week of a week of Sabbath of being with God, of knowing and reflecting on Him. It's a great opportunity to be apart from the busyness of exams, college, work um, direction, all those concerns and things, and to say, for, um, putting my time here to focus on Jesus. Great opportunity to know him, to know his saving power in your life and to know his purpose for you, to know what, your, what his yoke is for you, what he's calling you into. What a great opportunity. God is going to be speaking to you through that time. Be open to what he has to say because he might have lots of things for you to do coming out of New Day. There'll be great calls on your life, things that God is putting in you But this is a moment of starting in the Sabbath rest of knowing him before that happens. The writer of Hebrews chapter 13, um, in in chapter 13 and 14, writes about this invitation to enter God's rest. This perfect pattern of life, both now and in the future, he talks about. He talks that we need to take care and to continue to believe in the offer of life in and through Jesus. Through this day of rest in Jesus now, and there's going to be a day of rest coming when Jesus returns. And that's going to be a glorious moment. But in this meantime, we need to be making sure we are taking Sabbath moments, moments of rest in Jesus, knowing and loving him. We're not to give up and say, oh, everything is too hard. Or I'm not good enough. We're not to think that we must work harder to please God and get things done. But to understand Jesus has fulfilled the Sabbath requirement for us. So that we don't need, need to work harder to please God. We don't. Jesus has done it all for us. But we're to serve God in the rest of knowing that Jesus is with us. Jesus says, my burden is easy, my yoke is light. That's not just about sitting back and giving up. He's saying, there is some work to do, but you're joined with me. 
and you've already found rest for your souls in me. So the things I've got for you are, are going to be great. They're going to be good things, and we're going to do them together because you're yoked with me. To come to him and to find comfort and to strength to serve him, that's what Sabbath is about. Knowing that when we grow weary, we can come to him. As we look to serve our communities, and particularly look to how we to bring Jesus' community into Rehampton in particular, the task may seem overwhelming and challenging. There's much to do. But we must remember that fulfilling all that God has in store for us comes out of the spending time with Jesus, our place of restoration, strength, and rest. And Jesus' command to his disciples at the end of Matthew to go into all the nations making, and make disciples of all... What a, what a massive commandment to do. What a huge task. We just were showing a little bit about Cyprus and how we were able to speak to one or two people in that context. But there's nearly a million people on that island who need to know the rest and the Sabbath and, and Sabbath blessing of, of Jesus in relationship with God. It's an impossible task. It's huge. God does it. And Jesus commands his disciples to do it. Can you imagine? This band of 12 who've come from different backgrounds. Jesus is saying to them, go. Go into all the nations. Step outside your country and your boundary. Step outside your village that you maybe never even stepped outside of. To go and bring the good news of me to other people. Who are toiling and in need of the rest of the soul that they've only found in Jesus. But it doesn't, it doesn't, Jesus doesn't start with that commandment, does he, <laughs> to his disciples? He starts with the invitation to come, come and follow, come and join with me. Come if you're weary and broken, because I'm, I, my, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. It's an invitation. And they'd spent three years with Jesus, knowing him, seeing his power and love and mercy and compassion, seeing him killed and raised from the dead. Seeing him as Lord of the Sabbath, the God who commands rest. They'd been with him, they'd seen this. And so with this commandment, also Jesus like commands, like the commandment to Moses, Jesus says, but you've got to wait. Wait for the Holy Spirit to come. There's a moment of rest and setting aside the time to be with God and the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit will come, and then you will be my witnesses. So there's lots to do. As a commandment to reach nations with the good news of Jesus. And there's a, there's a commandment to, to draw that from knowing and being in Jesus' presence, waiting for the Holy Spirit to equip us, waiting for us to know the blessing of rest in God and the calling of God on our lives so that we're equipped and strengthened to do things God calls us to do, to serve him, to love him, and to love others with the love that he shows. So we're building in these moments of Sabbath rest to be with God. Today is a great time to do that. It's why we gather together, isn't it? It's a moment to reflect on the goodness of God and the joy of God. But we need to be doing that, as that writer of Hebrews said, to continue to bear in mind. Because rest and work are God-given. And we're to enjoy them in the blessing that God has given us through Jesus Christ. Knowing his salvation, knowing his love and mercy and grace band are going to come up. We're going to spend some time with God. As the band is to come up, let's just, if, you, if you're able to, why don't you stand? Rest is God-given and he, he he wants to restore, I think, right balance and right thinking in people's hearts and minds today about what God is, who God is. God is not a harsh taskmaster. That's maybe where some of you are, have landed at the moment. You're thinking, God is a harsh taskmaster. There's so much that is, God demands of me that I'm unable to fulfill. I'm unable to do. I just can't do it. And then maybe there's been a tendency to give up. And God says, no, come and find rest in me again. Come and know me. 
Come and send, set time aside with me. I don't need your work. <laughs> I don't need your sacrifice. That's what God says. I just need you to be with me. Why don't you come and rest in my presence? God wants to restore that wonderful relationship, that wonderful pattern of working and resting in Him in your life. Maybe that's you. God just wants to minister peace and rest to you. You suddenly find yourself falling asleep. Feel free to do so. Fall on the floor. Rest in God's presence. It's a beautiful thing. Let's just come now to God's presence. Let's just know Him. Ask Him to come meet with us.